Merry Christmas. Feliz Navidad. Well, I love Christmas movies. Not all of them, just some of them. My favorites are very deep theologically. Elf, The Christmas Story, uh, what a, oh, The Polar Express, that's a good one. Uh, What's a Wonderful Life. So I know that we traditionally call this the Midnight Mass, so I figured I've got at least a good 45 or 50 minutes to preach, and it's going to be great. So just settle down. It's going to be a good time. But the good thing about Christmas movies is the way that they kind of start with this story of a problem, right? And it kind of takes us into this environment where good always beats evil, love always wins, and we go through the story of a problem of someone being in depression where something bad has happened, and the things seem to be hopeless, and then in the end, it works out. Especially in, like, It's a Wonderful Life, right? George Bailey, poor guy. But it works out. And Isaiah, the prophet, as we heard earlier, kind of gives us a Christmas story. And if you read it earlier, before the reading, Israel is in captivity. And they have not going through a good time. Times are not good. And then the prophet says, but guess what? It's okay. Because there's a child coming. A child is coming who's going to remove you from this oppression. A child is coming that is going to give you a sense of peace. A child is coming that's going to conquer darkness. This child, the same child that's coming is the same child that we celebrate today. The same child was more than just a baby born in a manger, but the big word we use is the incarnation. This baby was God incarnate born of the Virgin Mary, who would come to release us from oppression and release us from captivity. We hear the story in Exodus about how God had sent Moses to free the Hebrews from Pharaoh, right? The whole let my people go. And Moses had them released to the power of God from their oppression and slavery, but now we have the new Moses, Jesus Christ who has come not just to remove us from the oppression of rulers, but to remove us from the oppression of sin and the oppression of slavery to sin and bondage and oppression of our souls. How about that? That's pretty good. Now, I know it's, it's late, but you can talk back to me. It's okay. Because I'm tired too. <laughs> this is what's so great about the new Moses is that it's more than just being physically broken from bondage, but spiritually we're being made free. Freedom. Freedom to love. Freedom to go in peace and change the world. Freedom to be all that God wants you to be. Your story, your story doesn't end in darkness and despair. We're not stuck in the middle of a Christmas movie. Because of Christ. We've been released from pain. And that is what we celebrate today. While the work of salvation has been complete, the fulfillment of God's plan is still out there, right? We are kind of like George Bailey. Remember in the movie where George is like, everything is just falling apart, right? Town hates him. His wife hates him. His kids hate him. His dog hates him. There's just a mess, right? And he's out wandering around the streets. And then Clarence comes. And what does Clarence do? He tells him, it's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. And you know what? We might find ourselves like George Bailey in times of darkness, in times of pain in our lives. But we don't have to be conquered by our fears and by our pain and by our disappointments and by our, our, the, those things that keep us kind of from being all that God wants us to be. We have a Clarence, a little better than Clarence. We have God, God incarnate, who is here, who has broken those things so that we can be free to hope, 
so that we can be free to know that there's something greater out there. Look, this life is not to say that there's never going to be seeds and watermelons and peach when have fuzz and unicorns and ponies and puppies. It's Dunkin' Donuts, I mean, it's great, but that's not reality. Sometimes life is hard. And sometimes things don't always work out like we hope, but we have a hope that's much greater than what this life gives us right now. That hope is that because of Christ, bondage is conquered, sin is conquered, pain is conquered, and guess what? Death is conquered. We know this because of the incarnation, because when Christ came, he came born, in the, born of a virgin in the manger from God himself to be God, and guess what? He was also the firstborn of the dead. See, here's the thing. We love to have this night of Christmas. And we come and we get around the manger and we sing the songs. And we say, oh, isn't this lovely? We've gone to church tonight. But this is empty. This means nothing without the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. Why does it mean nothing? Because it was through the death of Christ and through his burial and his resurrection that death has finally been conquered, that empire has lost its power, and the kingdom of God reigns because of the resurrection, the firstborn of the dead. That is why we have hope. That is why when we're in the middle of the George Bailey struggle, we can say we still have hope. We still have hope because we serve a Savior who isn't dead. We serve a Savior who isn't still in a manger. We serve a Savior who is alive and well and interceding on our behalf. And that is where our hope is. Psalm 96 tells us, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord a new song. What is our new song? Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. He has come to redeem us and set us free. He has come to break those things that keep us from being able to love and to be loved. You are more than conquerors because of what Jesus Christ has done for you. Did you know that? I guess not. You are. You are special, created by God for a purpose. You are created to love and to be loved. And you can only do that perfectly because of the love that you have experienced through Jesus. The God who came to Moses in the burning bush is still the same God who led the Hebrews out of Egypt. He's still the same God that came and was born in a manger. He's still the same God that changed water into wine, that loved and taught the disciples how to love. He's still the same God that intercedes for us, that prays in the Garden of Gethsemane, that was nailed to a cross for our sins, was buried, and is the same God that was resurrected three days later. And during those three days, he kicked in the gates of hell, kicked in the gates of death, and said, these are my children. And just like Moses in Exodus said, let my people go. And because of that, we celebrate today because this begins our freedom. This, be this begins our separation from death and into life. This is our Independence Day, where we become the bride of Christ, and we wait. It's not finished yet. See, the story's not done yet. Where's, where's Father Jason's dad? How am I doing? Am I all right? Okay. We wait for the fulfillment of our salvation. We heard that in the epistle. Paul says the grace of God has appeared, and yet they wait for the manifestation of the glory of our God and Savior Jesus Christ. What are we waiting for? We're waiting for his second coming. We're waiting for his return when the work is completed. He's no longer a baby. He's no longer on a cross. He's no longer in a grave, but he is with his Father in heaven, preparing a place. Preparing a place for us. In ancient Jewish tradition, when a, a bride is engaged to her groom, 
The groom has to go, and, and he builds an extension to their house. They build this extension to bring his bride back to. And it's interesting that in the tradition, the only time that the groom can leave to go get his bride is when the father says it's done. You know where I'm going with this. We are the bride of Christ. And he's with his father preparing a place for you and I to go. And all he's waiting for is his father to say, son, go get your bride. We are his bride. And so we wait and we labor and we love and we celebrate Eucharist. And we come to Mass because it's the community of faith. And we say we are chosen by God for a purpose. And so we wait for him to come. This is more than a tradition or a celebration of something that we do out of some kind of a cultural experience. This is a relationship that we have. This is a relationship that changes the hearts of women and men and children for 2,000 years. Because there's more out there. God has more for you. And I don't know where you're at tonight. Maybe you've got this all figured out. Maybe you know you're good. But maybe you sit here tonight and you're like, you know, I'm here because my mom said I have to be here. I'm here because my dad said I don't get a Christmas present if I don't come to church. Or maybe you're just trying to make sense of this whole thing. And my message to you is this. If you want to know what the story of Christmas is, if you want to know what tonight is all about, it's very simple. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever, no matter who you are, no matter where you come from, no matter what you've done, the sins you've committed, how rotten or filthy you think you are, he has come to bring you eternal life. And that eternal life is what our hope is. That eternal life is what gives us strength. That eternal life is what makes us know that as disappointing and struggles as life may be, there's a greater future out there. There's a greater hope out there that Jesus Christ himself came so that we could have relationship with him, have relationship with God, and not be bound by empire, but be free from those things, free from the power of death, free from the power of sin. This is about freedom. So what are you going to do? What are you going to do? You going to leave here and say, well, that was pretty. That was nice. Or do you leave here knowing that you have been, that you have experienced Christ, that your life has been changed and transformed. And so now, what do you do to live for him? Because he's coming. Christ is coming again and salvation will be completely fulfilled. And then we will have joy everlasting. Joy that will be fulfilled. And then we will sing joy to the world. Because the Lord has come, not just the first time, but now he's come back. And we will reign with him in glory forever and ever. Amen.